Good day, everyone. Um, I'm here to give a very short talk about the factories of the future, or depending on how you look at it, the future of factories. But before I begin, I think it's rather important that you hear about what happened in the summer of 2001, when I was 20. It wasn't a big thing. I had decided to say yes to an opportunity that turned out to change my perspective forever, but it also made my parents very worried. I said yes to a summer job at the Volvo car manufacturing plant out in Tuschlanda at the night shift. And this, to my parents, seemed very alien somehow, because they didn't know what went on in a factory. And indeed, their, their image of a factory was something like this. Boring, anonymous, who knew what went on within these walls? And as far as they could tell, why would anyone, especially their daughter, want to be welding floor pieces for car bodies in the middle of the night? But nonetheless, I decided that I was going to take that summer job. And once I got in and spent that summer working there, it became a living place for me. I got to know my night shift teammates, and I learned some things that turned out to be very valuable for my future as a researcher at Chalmers in social sustainability and ergonomics for future production. One thing I learned was that I was definitely a night owl, which is still a successful strategy for me today. And another thing, which is more of an anecdote, was something my uh, night shift colleagues told me, which was that lifting devices are for little girls. So I spent that entire summer lugging very large pieces of metal around just to prove myself. And that knowledge is very valuable if you start looking into psychosocial aspects of future production places. So that was a bit about my past, and I promised you I was going to talk about the future. And now that I'm a researcher, I found that it would probably be a good idea if I took it upon myself to prepare a bar chart to explain what that future looks like. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the population of Europe in the year 2012. So obviously on this side we have the younger people. Uh, you can imagine that the shortest one of these bars is about 30 million people. And over here are the older people. And quite appropriately, 32-year-olds end up exactly in the middle. And what happens with this population is that as time goes by, the people who are on this end, they start retiring from their jobs and of course, these numbers move into new age brackets as time goes by, but wait a minute. Um, if you look at the math, it doesn't add up because there's quite a large number of people who are 30 and upwards who are currently working, while at the same time, there's quite a few people in the younger bracket, meaning that we're going to have a staffing problem, particularly for production in the future. And um, this means, on the other hand, that both younger people who uh, need to be attracted to the factories of the future, and the older people who sit on all the experience and all the tacit knowledge about how to uh, make things in production, they're both going to become very valuable resources in the future. So this bar chart has two implications. One is that we have to start designing factories and workplaces so that the elderly can make the best use of the refill of sand in their hourglass. Because as it turns out, we can't drop all those people in one go and expect to uh, retain the knowledge that is currently out there in production. At the same time, the younger generation have needs that also need to be designed into the fu future factories. And there was an interesting Twitter from the, um, uh, from the Swedish Central Bureau of Statistics the other day about this generation, the digital natives. They were saying that out of those people who are born today, 50% have a chance to become 92 years old. So what we're looking at is a future where, as we age, we get healthier and therefore probably can keep on working and living and making a livelihood. But this livelihood has to become meaningful enough to attract a new generation of workers. So this is a little bit of the, um, the basis for my research. And if we take this demographic idea and the idea that we have to both encourage and support old and young to exchange knowledge in a workplace and perform to their best ability, both at the end where perhaps the body starts uh, needing more support in order to have the efficiency uh, for the entire day, but also for people who need support to learn new things. 
connectivity may be the answer. And a lot of the projects we're working on at Chalmers concerning the operators and the factories of the future have to do with bringing forth that technology. How do we get the experienced to collaborate and communicate with those who are just learning the job? So this is a very exciting time to be working with social sustainability and production because I find that this is actually very provocative. And not because it's made of lace, but because uh, similar to the debate going on about whether global warming is a fact or not, some people can't merge this image of a lack of people to refill our factories with the idea that's been going on for so long that factory jobs are disappearing and they're moving abroad. So it's going to be a very interesting challenge to convince people that the math doesn't add up. We need to start designing our factories to meet this challenge. And to finish off, I would like to bring you back to the summer of 2002, when I returned to the factory for a second period of night shift summer work. And I was greeted at the door by my old night shift team who saw me walking in and they said to me, what is wrong with you? Why are you back? <laughs> and in the future, I would hope that a team like that would welcome back a student with the words, hey, welcome back. You're missing all the fun. Where have you been? And uh, considering what many of my speaker colleagues here have said today, I expect that fun to be starting right about now. Thank you.